Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'm going to say happy first day of fall. We're starting a new season. I'm ready for it. I know it's been so hot and the weather like it is. So this is the first day of fall, and we're going to be happy because we're starting a new season. Before you know it, it'll be winter, uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So we're going to be excited now today and tonight <clears throat> because we're starting a fall. The day was our first day. So um, my name is Marsha. I am one of three youth teachers for Faith Family Church of God. Um, I want to say welcome to everyone, but especially to our youth. I hope you're all out there or you're going to start coming in here in just a few minutes. Um, you're going to need your Bible. I've got mine here. You're going to need a piece of paper and pen because, as usual, uh, on my classes, during my classes, uh, the, the scriptures, either I have them up on the screen and or some of it just has this where you can find it. So you may want to keep uh, your pen and paper handy so you can look up the scriptures later. So right now I'm going to start with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you help us to speak life and not death. Place a guard over our mouths in Jesus' name that we, may not, we will not speak anything that is in opposition of your word and promises. I plead the blood of Jesus against every negative word we've ever said, canceling out your power. From this day on, let us make a decision to speak your blessings upon our lives and the lives of others. I thank you, Lord, that by your strength and with the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to do this. Father, I thank you in advance for the blessings you're sending our way. We receive your blessings and we'll declare them daily. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, my lesson tonight, the title is Power of Words. And you see here, all these words that's going across the screen, I'm going to put my helmet on because they're negative words. I'm going to protect my brain. There we go. Now, they're colliding, they're bombarding me. We have the word, uh, let's see, we, I see hasn't, couldn't, shouldn't, wasn't, what if, however, haven't, doesn't didn't, weren't, I mean, all sorts of negative words up there that can bombard our brains. And, you know, we get to thinking that we cannot do anything, and we have to have some type of encouragement to get past these negative words. Uh, words can be used in so many ways. This lesson is going to touch on how they affect our own lives and how they can affect others. It is so important to think before we speak. Words are powerful. Once they are said, you cannot take them back. You can't reach out there if you said something ugly to your grandmother or your parents or somebody. You cannot reach out and grab it and put it back in your mouth. Once it's out, it is out there. I'll hear a lot of ifs, what ifs, and a negative matter. Even though you know, you've, you've done something good, but then you say, well, what if? You know, you're questioning that good thing you question it what if i did this but what if uh, what if it may not happen may even happen but the enemy puts in thoughts that, that no matter what even if it's good there is a what if it may have been something good that's happened but the enemy is going to jump on you right away and say what if what if it's not true what if it's not as good as you think what if tomorrow is going to be different than today that's why you're not supposed to worry about tomorrow because it's have its own problems. But you don't think about the past. You don't, you don't worry about tomorrow. You just live for the day. What if involved to turn the good into evil? That becomes a worry about something that might not even occur. You know, I doubt the, these young kids, you know, the youth probably don't worry about it. Now, most of us older people do. We worry about things that might not even occur because of what if. I had school teachers at, um, before, I mean, I, believe it or not, I did go to school. When I was in elementary and, and, and middle school, I was junior high school, I remember I had teachers that would not allow us to say, I can't or I ain't. Um, they said, there's no way you're not going to say can't or can't in my classroom because you can, you can. They were very encouraging teachers. They would not let you be negative to yourself. You know, because that's what the enemy does. He wants you to think that you can't do something. Words are powerful, even when they're in just in your mind. In your mind, you know, even before you say them, God knows what you're thinking. Uh, the enemy doesn't. He may put those words in there. But um, 
the Lord knows before you say it what's in your mind. He's the only one that can read your mind. Here's something interesting that, that, that I found out about words. I searched the World Wide Web for how many words are, in, are used, how many words are out there. It says that there are 218,632 words in the English language. That's 218,632 words in the English language. I found that 50% of this 2,832,000 uh, words, half of them, are negative. 50% of them are negative. 30% are positive, and 20% are neutral. Now, I don't know what they're considering as neutral. I, I, I always thought either you had a positive word or a negative word, so I don't, I don't know what they mean when they say neutral. That is something to remember during this lesson. So this lesson is going to um, touch on the positive words and on the negative words. And I'm going to use Job during this lesson, and once I get to it, you'll understand why. I want to say something um, about another thing about words. You know, salespeople they have to use good words because if they don't if they don't make you feel good about their product, or if they don't really seem to be confident about their product, um, is that going to sell? That's not like with um, I'm going to use Alicia as an example. I asked her if I could borrow her as an example. She said she don't know how I would, but I could. Uh, Alicia sells jewelry. You know, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it, paparazzi. She sells paparazzi jewelry, and she is sold on it. She loves, she loves selling um, paparazzi. If she didn't, and if she got up there and during her party, you know, paparazzi party and on on fa Facebook, and said something like, you know, this is a pretty necklace, yellow necklace, but if you have green eyes, it, it'll clash. So we've got that butt in there. Or she says, this, this necklace is, well, it's, it's yellow, but it's not the right shade of yellow. You may not like it. I mean, there's too many negative words, but a salesperson would not do that when they're trying to sell their product. She doesn't do that. She goes, everything's pretty. Everything she sells is pretty. So I, I, I wanted to use her as, as an example of how important it is that you use positive words every day. No matter what you're doing, whether you're selling or trying to encourage somebody, um, it's important to be positive, and positive means positive, happy words. Now, I'm going to show you something. And you probably wonder why does she have rocks and sticks as her backdrop? I mean, you see those sticks and stones up there. I'm fixing to explain something to you. Now, I had this habit on represent a body of an um, army of God because, like I said, you know, your brain has to be protected from negative, you know, from, from, from evil. So that's the reason I had my the helmet on to protect my, my brain. Scientific um, research has proven that the words we say and think affects our health. A few weeks ago, I spoke about the brain and the heart. I, mean, I had a lesson about how the brain and the heart are connected. It is really amazing how powerful our brain is to affect the rest of our bodies. Okay, now I'm going to show you something. Because I'm fixing to talk about this in a minute. This is a stick. Now, those sticks up there is like you would normally, you know, see out in the yard, whatever. This is a pretty heavy, thick stick. If I hit you with that stick, it's going to hurt, right? It's going to hurt bad, especially if I keep hitting you with it over and over and over with it. It's going to hurt. And eventually, it might even... Um, be fatal might actually kill you if I hit you in the right spot as many times as I well I could. So sticks can kill. You know the person who has the stick is good. The stick is only to do what you do with it, use it for. But you, I could use this and it could cause a fatality if I used it enough. Same way with Mr. Rockwell here. This is one of the family members of our rocks. Remember, Miss, this is the stone, the rock. Mr. Rockwell, he's the largest rock. But if I took that and I threw it at Robert and hit him just right in the head. Remember David and Goliath? If I hit him just right with this rock, it would probably kill him, right? Well, that's a, that's a serious thing to think about because there's a, a quote that's out there that's been round and round and round for a long time. It was by Stephen Fry. I'm going to give him credit. It's, it says, um, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will always 
hurt me. Now, I always thought it meant, it always said, um, but words will never hurt me. But the actual quote is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will always hurt me. So think about that a minute. You know, like I said, these, these two things could physically hurt you to the point that it could kill you. <clears throat> words themselves would not kill you, right? Have, I think we agree on that. You can't just throw a bunch of words out and physically kill somebody with them. But we're going to talk about this in a minute. How do you feel when someone um, insults you? Okay. Um, before we got started here, Robert made a comment about my hair because it was not just right. I had not finished getting dressed. He said he was trying to get everything set up. And he said, it just don't look right. What's wrong with your hair? I had to tell him I hadn't fixed it yet. So, I mean, it, it hit me wrong. I knew he was trying to be constructive, but it hit me wrong to think that he first thing he noticed was my hair. And instead of saying I need to go fix, he said, what's wrong with it? You know, that, that's constructive, but I didn't take it as constructive. It sort of hit me wrong at the timing that he did it. <clears throat> um, many, many of us have heard this, these phrases. But I'm going to back up a minute back to um, what words can do to us. I, got, I sort of got ahead, got ahead of myself. I had spoken about the brain and the heart. It's amazing how powerful our brain is to affect the rest of our bodies. Our words affect our brain function, which affects our health. Every time we say, listen to this, every time we say have a sad, hopeless, unkind thought, our brain releases chemicals that makes our body feel awful. Our brain does that. When we, when we, um, Every time we have a sad, a hopeless, unkind thought, our brain releases chemicals that makes our body feel awful. Muscles get tense, blood pressure rises, and the heart beats faster. The opposite happens when we're happy, hopeful, and loving. The brain releases a completely different set of chemicals when you're happy. Your muscles relax, you breathe regularly, and your blood pressure decreases. So, you know, you, you, you start wondering, now, if that's the case, why would anybody want to be sad? You know, I've, I've heard many, many years people say, well, it takes less muscles to smile than it is to frown. So I can understand, you know, what they're saying in that point because, like I said, your brain and your heart affects you and takes care of your whole body. Let me get back on here. Um, like I said, we've, many of us have heard this phrase for, by Stephen Fry, it says, um, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will always hurt me. Many of us heard this phrase before, but have you ever noticed that it's easier to remember the hurtful things said to you than the good things? Truth be told, words are very powerful, and if used the wrong way, can hurt you. God tells us in his word that death and life are in the power of the, what, the tongue. You know, you think something that small or that, you know, inside your mouth, you can control it a whole lot better because all you have to do is go about that and keep it in there and keep your mouth shut. I've heard people zip a lock, you know, or tick, whatever, tick a lock, whatever. In other words, okay, then it says, um, God tells us this word that death and life are in the power of the tongue and that they, love, they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 18.21 in other words, you will eat what you speak. The outcome of your future is a byproduct product of what you speak, whether it's good or bad. Based upon scripture, your words can do two things for you. It can either curse you or bless you. However, I'm going to focus on how we as Christians curse ourselves or cu yeah, curse ourselves and other by speaking negatively and foolishly. Now, like I said, we've had a, I had a lesson uh, a few weeks ago about that too, being negative or positive or optimistic or pessimistic or realistic. All this goes together, you know, in Scripture. You know, you, if you look back at some of these other lessons that we've all had, um, they sort of connect. It's really, it's really amazing how they all connect together. Okay, Proverbs 18.7 says, A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. For better understanding, let's look at what the NIV says. The mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. Now think about that. The mouths of fools 
fools or they're ruined. They've ruined themselves because of their, their talking foolishly. I mean, they've ruined their, their reputation. They've, they've ruined their life by speaking um, by, foolishly. Um, they trapped themselves with their lips. We're going to look at this scripture in a minute. According to dictionary.com, a fool can be defined as a weak-minded person, one who lacks judgment or sense. So according to Proverbs 18.7, the words of a fool or weak-minded person can bring about their ruin, wreck destruction, they'll have destruction, and downfall and mess up, collapse, and defeat. In other words, your mouth can lead to your destruction and defeat. It can lead to poverty, lack, unhappiness, a failed marriage, low self-esteem, and more. When speaking negative and foolishly, whether you're playing, y'all like people, I'm just, I'm just playing with you. I'm just joking with them, you know. Really? You know, because most of the time when that happens, it's come from somewhere. That's what I've always complained about different people, you know, say something to me jokingly. And I, and, you know, I understand, but they'll come back later and say, now, you know, that popped in your head for some reason. It might have been a joke, but for it to be a joke, you, you know, it came from somewhere in your heart or in your mind. Um, when speaking negative and foolishly, whether playfully or out of anger, what you're actually doing is cursing the blessings God has for you and others. Your negative speaking not only affects your life, including circumstances in your life, but it also impacts the lives of others as well. Common sense is very important in our lives. Um, not because I was going to say this, but my husband makes a joke compliment compliment about my appearance or something I have said it hurts you know it doesn't hurt deep but I you know it hurts enough that I look back and I say now did I warrant I mean did I deserve that do I need to change something you know and he you know he jokes believe it or not he does joke um but I have a pen that even a joking manner the idea of the joke hurts however when he says something complimentary like my, my he calls me his beautiful wife or it makes me feel proud. And you say, I'm proud of you. It, it, it goes back to what I said about the brain wall, the, the chemicals that's released. It makes me feel happy. You know, words that your loved ones, your family, friends, people that you're around are very important. Um, it's very important because, like I said, it affects your health. Simple words can mean so much to people. That is, what is in, why it's so important to be careful what you say. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. It's a good pause. Remember, keep that tongue in your mouth. Zip lock. No one likes to be scourged, discouraged. I know I don't. Avoid speaking, saying, or surrounding yourself around people who are speaking negative around about you. You know, when you go out on a date or you go out with your friends and, and they're talking negative, you know, remember, who you surround yourself affects your health, too. I mean, not, you know, not just crime, you know, criminal way of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you're around people that are always negative, um, they don't see good in anything, uh, eventually it's going to affect you in the sense that you're depressed, and you're going to be wondering, why am I so depressed? Why am I feeling so down? Well, it's because you, all you've heard for, from your friends were for negative, uh, I can't, or you don't, or we won't, we can't, you know negative things about you know you, you need to do something about your hair you need something about your clothes you know if you never hear anything good um positive you, it's going to affect you physically and mentally god said he has plans to prosper you not to harm you so avoid saying things such as i'm broke i have no money i'm just barely making it this, along with any other negative thing, all goes against the blessings God has in store for you. Instead, say, I'm wealthy. I have more than enough. My God shall supply all my needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Our words can either be our strength or our weakness. God is the only one who knows our words before they come out of our mouth. Remember, he's the only one that can read our, read our minds. The enemy uses our words against us and everyone around us. Words are powerful. I am going to use the book of Job now as an example of power of words. Um, we all know the story about Job. 
you know, I'm not going to go through the whole story because what, what I'm going to center on are his friends. Remember talking about you surround yourself, you need to surround yourself with good friends? Well, Job had three friends that had heard what had happened to him. Now, remember, I'm going to sort of uh, refresh your memory a little bit about Job. He was wealthy. God had blessed him tremendously. He had good health. He had homes. He had, had children. He had livestock. I mean, he, he helped people. He was a good man. And God knew it. God knew, God, God knew Job's heart. And one day, uh, you know, like I said before, God and, and, and Satan, they had meetings. You know, just because uh, Satan got thrown out of, of heaven doesn't mean God doesn't um, still rule over him. You know, he, so they were having this meeting, and he said, well, Satan, what you been doing lately? He says, I am looking for somebody to devour. I'm trying to find somebody's soul, get somebody's soul. And God's the one that pointed Job out. He said, have you ever considered my, ser my servant Job? And uh, Satan said, how can I? You've got him protected so well, I can't touch him. He said, I'll tell you what. Um, you do what you want, except do not touch him. Do not do anything to him personally, to his body, whatever. So that's what Satan did. He went out there, and um, one day, um, messengers started showing up to, to Job, run right after another. But, but before one got finished, um, another one showed up. When you're talking about when it rains, when it rains, it pours. It was pouring this day. Um, he lost his um, livestock. He lost his servants. He left. Lost his family. He lost. He lost everything. He lost everything he had. But he did not blame God. He did not curse God. He not. He did not quit. He did not give up. So Satan went back to God, and God said, "Well, okay." You know, he told him. Said that it's still where he's okay. Um, go ahead and and you know do what you do. If you want to touch, but don't kill him. You know. So he made um, Job real sick. And this is when his friends start hearing about what had happened to him three of his friends decided they had a had a plan they all met together these three friends met together and they said we're gonna go see let's go see job let's go and encourage him let's tell you know they, they had heard what had happened to him they felt really bad for him and from a distance where they they went to see him and before they got to him they saw him at a distance and he didn't even look like himself they almost didn't recognize him and they got so upset that they ripped off his robes, they put dust on their heads, and they screamed, you know, they cried out loud. They were just pitiful, pitiful friends. Now, they, like I said, they were supposed to be encouraging him. But when they got to him, I don't understand their purpose in this. Maybe Brother Lynn may have to explain this one day. They all ended up sitting for seven days and seven nights just sitting on the ground. Nobody said anything. Now, they had been crying all this and as they saw Job, but no one ever said anything for seven days and seven nights. And they can find, keep in mind, they had planned on encouraging their friend. Now, if you had friends like that, you know, that does not know what to say for seven days and seven nights, uh, there's a problem. They became whiners. They became part of the problem. I mean, they became um, discouragers to Job. Um, the first one to finally talk was Job, and that's where I'm fixing to start right there. Um, do try to notice how many com there were many conversations in the Bible in the Book of Job. Um, I, I'm just skimming through it because there's so many of them. There were so many speeches. Each one of these friends had speeches that they gave to they gave to Job. And Job always had a comeback. He never cursed you know, God, but he never um, had any encouraging words from his friends. And he made that clear to them. Each time they, he got, they got through talking, he came back and said, what kind of friends are you? I mean, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're not encouraging me at all. Anyway, um, Job 2, 11 through 13. Let me read that from my Bible here. Hold on. Okay, Job 2, verses 11 through 13. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shiite, and Zophar the Nebuchadnezzar heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with Job and comfort him. 
When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Okay, like I said, nobody spoke for seven days or seven nights because they knew how bad he was suffering, but still they had no encouraging words. You know, they didn't, I guess they didn't even hug him. You know, say, Job, we are so sorry to see this. You know, I mean, they didn't put their arms around him. They just sat on the ground and moped you know, for seven days and seven nights. Then Job 3, verse 3, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Okay, so after seven days of sitting there and seven nights, Job finally spoke. He was the first one to speak, and he regretted ever being born. He cursed his birth. Um, I have I have heard people say, "Why was I ever born?" They're being such so depressed, but they'd actually say. Why was I ever born? What is my purpose? Why am I here? I am just, I, they are cursing themselves. They are cursing their lives. Instead of saying, I am here for a reason. I am a child of God. They're so depressed that they're using their words to bring themselves down. And this is what Job did. Job said, he opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. Let's see here. Okay, Job's three friends, like I said, had heard what had happened to him and decided to go and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep out loud, tore their robes, and sprinkled dust on their heads. For seven days and seven nights, they sat with him on the ground without saying a word. Um, then Job 3, we did that. When he opened his mouth, he cursed the day of his birth. My thought on this about Job was that the conference, um, he started the conversation by wishing he had never been born. His friends finally spoke. The first one to speak well, was Elias, I don't know, Elias Vaz, E-L-I-P-H, I don't know how to pronounce their names. He said in Job, Job 4, 3 through 5, he said, Think about how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands, your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened, strengthened faltering knees. But now trouble comes to you, and you are discouraged. It strikes you, and you are dismayed. Consider now, who, being innocent, has ever been perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. He was telling Job, you know, Job, you, you were a good man. You did all this, you know, you, you were a pillar of the community. You, you did things for people. You're a good, good man. But something's happened because God doesn't punish people doing good things. You know, I have, I've heard that a lot from people. So why do good, bad things happen to good people? Well, at the end of this story, we're going to, God, God speaks to Job, and we're going we're gonna to find out what his answer was to Job about that. He tells Job that Job had a source of strength for others, that Job was an inspiration to others. His speech started out good because he was bragging on Job about what he had done you know, for the community. But it ended up bad by saying Job had sinned, thereby that caused all of his problems. He told Job that he needed to confess to God for his wrongdoings. Job answered with that he knows everything that his friend had said about God. He already knew all that. He knew that. Job, with, Job answered his friend with anguish, like in Job 6.14 says, A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. But my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams, as the streams that overflow. Job is fussing at his friends. They're not consoling him. They're not helping him. They're, they're blaming him for his problems, and he knows he's innocent. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I know when, when I get blamed for something or, or something happens to do, and I, to me, and I know I didn't do anything, you know, and it may not be physical like Job, but it hurts. When I get blamed for, you know, well, didn't you hear this or didn't you see this? No, 
I didn't hear it. I didn't see it. Well, I know you did. You know, when I get blamed for something that I didn't do, and in Job's case, he was being, you know, he felt like he was being punished for something that, you know, he knows nothing about. He had no idea why this had happened to him so suddenly, so suddenly, right behind each other. Everything happened at once. He found his friends as unsupportive ones. He wasn't getting any sympathy. He was getting blamed for his situation. The next friend of Job's that talked was Bildad. He used the words like, when your children sin, remember his children um, killed in a storm that came down, um, the house collapsed on him during the party, and they all died. He also said, used words like, God doesn't reject a blameless man. In other words, he was saying that Job, had, he was blamed for something, or God wouldn't be um, punishing him. Um, God doesn't strengthen the ha hands of evil doers. Doers, I guess he was trying to explain to Job that God doesn't punish the good, so Job must have done something bad. And Job replies like this. Job 9, 20 through 22 says, Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. In other words, if I'm innocent, I'd be, I would be telling my, on myself. I mean, I'd, I'd be really down. I'd be telling... I would be really upset. I am upset, but I would be telling myself I'm upset. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Although although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. In other words, he's saying God destroys the good people and the bad people. That's the way he was talking. That was the way he was thinking. God destroys both. That's how Job, because Job knew he had not done anything. Job was speaking death over his life. He knew he was innocent. He had decided he no longer had any concern for his life and had made up his mind got, that God destroys the good and the bad. Okay, Job 11 14 through 15 and 17 says, and this is um, Zophar, this is his third friend. He used words iniquity and wickedness. This is what he says. If you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm and without fear. <laughs> He's got three wonderful friends, don't he? I mean, I don't know if what, what position I would feel. I mean, I don't know how I would feel if I was one of his friends. You know, I, I, I'm not in their shoes, but I can just imagine how Job is feeling. I mean, he, he had a reputation. Remember the reputation that we talked about in one of the lessons, how important your reputation is? He had a reputation of being a good man. So on, how in the world they think that, how they could have thought that he had done something to, to, for God to punish him you know uh first of all god didn't do the punishing you know he he was letting he was trying to see um how far job would go or how you know if he let satan um tempt him and everything and do all this too and take everything away from him um job's response was job 13 2, two through 3 what you know i also know i am not inferior to you I am no less than you. You know better than I am. I am not inferior to you. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. Okay, this is very, very important to see here. Understand this. He got to the point where he didn't feel like he needed to be defending himself to his friends. He didn't need to defend himself. He knew he was blameless. He knew he had not done anything. He wanted to talk to God. He wanted to talk to the Almighty. He wanted to plead his, plead his case. He wanted to know why God. Actually, Job was whining is what he was doing. He was whining. He was sniveling. But he never gave up on God. I mean, he, 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 he just was wanting to know why. They were saying God sends bad experiences and disasters to only wicked people. They thought Job had done something wicked due to all the things that had happened to him. Job was trying to counter all the negative speeches that he was listening to. He was sitting there listening to them, and he always had to come back to them. Speeches galore. I was trying to read all of them, and I said, this is, this is too depressing just to listen to him, just to read what they were saying to him. 
He finally said he wanted to argue his case with God. He wanted to defend himself to God. Okay, Job 2, 9, back it up a little bit, but I'm going to um, touch on his wife a minute. Job 2, verse 9. Job's wife even said, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Okay, now this is his wife. Okay? You think of you would think that if anybody would be encouraging to Job, it would be his wife. Now keep in mind she's lost the same thing that he has. She has lost all the property, all the kids, all the children, the houses, you know, everything that God had given them. And now her husband is sick. Now she knew she wasn't sick, but her husband was sick. He had all these sores on him. But she didn't go up to him and put her arm around him and hug him and say, Job, I love you. Or, Job, I am so sorry this has happened. I don't know what to do. What can I do? You know, she was not sympathetic either. She was as bad if, as if not worse than his friends because here she was his wife and she was telling him to die. You know, was he still holding on to his integrity, you know, to his reputation, to just curse God and die? But his response was strong was strong he said um he told her that she talks like a foolish woman I was trying to figure out what my notes was um she gave up she didn't put her arms around him said we'll get through this together we didn't she didn't encourage him at all but he didn't listen to her he just told that she talks like a foolish woman that he was not going to do that he was not going to curse god and die so, now, Job 12, 4 says, Job, Job even acknowledges that he had become a laughingstock to his friends. He was innocent of any do, wrongdoing. Well, he was, I don't see how he would interpret his uh, predicament as being a laughingstock. But it depending on what words people were using, what were they saying about Job? What were they saying to him in town? You know, because it, it had gotten around, undoubtedly. I mean, his friends knew, which means everybody knew that that he had lost everything. It wasn't just his friends. Everybody, everybody knew that he was sick, that he had lost everything, and he was a good person. So here they are, all these people, and you know, gossiping about him. I can just hear it. I can see it. You know, you, your friends or your your neighbors, everybody saying, "You know, I wonder what Job did." You know, and he becomes a laughing stock. That's why he thinks he's a laughing stock stock of his friends, even though he was innocent. Job 16, 1 through 5. Job said, I have heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. He's telling them they're terrible at comforting. These are his friends. I have heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I also speak like you. If you were in my place... If you were in my place, okay, I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you and my fingers at you. I could do the same thing, but my mouth would encourage you. In other words, he wouldn't do them like they were doing him. He would be encouraging them. You, I would be encouraging you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. But he's telling them, you know, he was saying, when will you stop your, your speeches? You're not doing any good. You're making things worse. You're not making me feel any better. You're miserable speakers. You're not comforters. You're miserable. You're making me miserable. When will you stop? And if I was in your place, now have you done this before? I've done this before. If I was in your shoes, if you were in my shoes, um, what would you do? What would you do if you were in job's shoes or what would job do if he was in your shoes that's what he's saying to his friends if he was in their shoes and they were in and they were in his shoes he would be comforting them he would be sympathizing with them he would be he would be um blessing them he would be talking them up he would not be giving them all these long speeches horrible speeches now during all this time god is watching and he's listening to everything that's being said and we know how things end with Job. God rebukes Job's friends, and he has a long talk with Job. God actually told Job to stop whining. In Job 38, 3, he says, Now, 
Prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And mine says, my version of it says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. In other words, stand up like a man. You know, quit, quit sitting there, quit sitting there whining and complaining. Stand up like a man. He said, he reminded Job, now this is where it's interesting, y'all. This is where it comes in about why good things, bad things happen to good people. And um, bad things happen to good people, just like bad things happen to bad people. Now, about both, you know. Um, God told Job, he asked him, he asked him question after there's uh, several chapters, two or three chapters where God is asking this question, this, he's asking this in question form. Remember Jeopardy? He's asking this, these, saying these um, things in question form. He's not stating it, he's putting it in question form. He says, were you there when I created the eagle? Were you there? And he goes through what the eagle does. Were you there when I created the sea? And he goes through about the sea. Everything that he had created, he said, were you there? He told Job, he said, if I try to explain to you, now this is paraphrasing, if I try to explain to you why bad things happen to good people, you would not understand it. You would not understand the concept of why bad things happen to good people. And he used the fact of all these creations that he made. There are things that we will, we don't know about everything that he knows. We weren't there. None of us were there. Job wasn't there. We were not there. God created everything, and everything has something special. I was, I was talking to the pastor the other day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze this in real quick because it had nothing to do with the word word, the power word. But we all have a conscience. And the way it does, I mean, our conscience tells us what we should and shouldn't say. And once we say something bad, we know it. But God made all of us with the conscience. And that conscience, he, he knew technology was coming. He knew down the road all these years, decades, you know, many, 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 many years later, technology would advance. He did not want, you see what's happening now, he did not want anybody to find our conscience. He does not want anybody to change it. Um, he put it there for a reason. He has hidden it for a reason. Um, I've read um, research where they have looked everywhere. They think they found it, but then they didn't find it. They think they found it. They think that if they find it, they can control criminals. You know, but if they do that, they control everything. That takes away free will. When your conscience is taken away, um, you have given up your free will. Your conscience tells you right from wrong. So that's where the free will is. So God does not want that free will disturbed. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to get back to, the, to our present here. Have you ever done, any something, done something so wonderful, like maybe run a one-mile, um, let's say a five-mile race and win, or, or be a winner of any kind of contest? And you're patting yourself on the back. Say, oh, I did so good. Wait till I tell my parents. Wait till I tell my grandparents. They're going to be so excited that I've won the five-mile my five, five mile, um, race. I'm the first in the race. And you go up to them, and, and, and they're probably there already. I mean, they're watching you. They're watching you. You won. They're yelling, all that. And everybody's so excited. Then you have a friend that comes up and says, oh, you did so good. But you know what? You probably won't win next time because so and so is going to be running. Well, I mean, <laughs> they have they have taken the the excitement away because of because they're talking about what if, what if the next time you don't win, how are you going to react? You have to live at the moment, in the moment. And like I said, the words that you say to each other, words that you hear, are very important to your brain, to your body. It's your health. <laughs> um. Speak life, not death, over yourself or others. Speak the truth, but not death. That means, you know, a lot of people, it's hard to, you know, speak good things um, sometimes when you think that it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, that's when you try to just keep your mouth shut, you know, zip a lot. Just don't say anything. But um, saying um, things that are negative, 
to you about yourself or others, that's speaking life, um, death over yourself. It's, it's, it's taking away God's blessings. Begin speaking the word of God over your life. Find a scripture in the Bible that tells you what God has to say about your situation. Here's an example. The next time you want to say, no one loves me. Oh, I've heard that so many times. No one loves me. And then you go around trying to say, oh, I love you. I love you. We all love you. But nobody listens. They don't want to listen. You know, it's all me, 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 me. They don't, they don't, they don't believe or they don't want to believe. But here's the scripture says, John, no, it's John 15, 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. How awesome is it to know that God loves you? He loves all of us. He created all of us. But there's something about that, the powerful word of love. Love is the most powerful word that you can, that you can have and say. If you're in debt, instead of saying, I'll never get out of debt, say aloud. The Lord will open, um, Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. It's good scripture. As Christian, um, we need to stop blocking God's blessings by speaking negatively. God wants to bless us, but we become a hindrance to ourselves in receiving God's blessings when we speak things that are opposition of God's word. You know, God doesn't, um, he's not, he doesn't curse us. You know, uh, I've heard people talk about generational curses, you know, and I believe in those. But those have came from, from decisions that we make in our lives. But God doesn't. He's not the one that um, curses um, people. We are his children. I don't know any parent that would want to curse their children. They want their children to be successful. They want their children to have good health. They want their grandchildren. You know, they want the family's family to be happy. Um, no sadness, no depression. And that's what God is. God is our Heavenly Father. He is our number one um, Heavenly Father. He is our Father. We are we are princesses and prince, um, um, prince, prince, <laughs> to, 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 to God. Um, on today, we're going to make a decision. Um, Proverbs 15, 4 tells us that a tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Decide today that you will watch what departs from your lips. Make a choice to speak God's blessings over your life and others. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, we have the power to speak God's blessings over our lives. And with the same tongue, if used negatively, can speak curses over lives. You know, there's one thing we got to remember. The Holy Spirit and the enemy cannot live in the same place. And the Holy Spirit is going to be ruling. I mean, that's that's the main thing. You know, they cannot be in our lives. It's one or the other. Okay. Um. Here's an example of things that we say that sounds harmless, but it's actually stopping God's blessings in our life and this person or, or you, whatever. I'm broke. I have no money. I'll never get healed. I'm unattractive. I'm such a failure. I'll never find love. God doesn't love me. My marriage is going to fail. I'm going to lose my job. I'm so stupid. And I'm a warrior. By speaking these words, you claim to you claim it over your life, okay? If you say this all the time, it's going around in your mind over and over and over again. Um, that's what you believe. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to believe in this. This is this is this is um, declaring death over your future, over your life. By the, speaking these words, you're claiming it to be so in your life. You're decreeing and declaring brokenness. Even if you are sick, don't go around claiming it. Instead, say, "I'm healed." You may still be sick, but according to what this is saying, 
Don't say, don't go walking way around whining and complaining and saying, I'm sick. And most of the time, people know you're sick, you know. What you need to start doing is saying, I'm healed. I know God has healed me. He's going to heal me. I'm healed. I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to think negative anymore. I'm going to be saying, my back is healed. My, my head is healed. No more headaches. I do not have any more. Think it. Think positively. That's what it's saying. Um, do this for every other negative thing in your life, depending on what you speak. The very essence of our being, being was spoken into existence by God. Monitor what you speak. Listen to what you say. You know, like I said a while ago, once you say it, it's too late. And the same thing with thinking. You know, God knows what the th you're thinking, but you do too. So if you're thinking it, you're still declaring it. Get it completely out of your mind. Don't think it. Don't speak it. Every time you want to speak negative, stop, ask God to change your heart and to renew your mind. Then fix your mouth to speak God's blessings above your above, um, upon your life instead. Instead, this is what you ought to say. I'm a conqueror. I'm prosperous and rich. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. My marriage is saved. My family is saved in Jesus' name. I have God's favor upon my life. I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I have a, my career job in Jesus' name. Now, in conclusion, like I said, words are powerful. They are seeds that yield a good or bad harvest, depending on what you speak. There is power in finding scriptures on your particular situation and speaking what God has to say about it instead of your flesh. Now, I can, like I've said in, in the past, I have every question I've ever heard popped in my head, I can Google it. I can go on the computer, my phone, and, and put the exact question, what I'm wanting to ask, and it tells me the scripture, and I can actually find what I'm looking for. That's what you can do. It's the easiest way to do it. God wants to bless you. Don't let your mouth get in the way of your blessing. We should be speaking words of encouragement and love to each other and to each to ourselves. I love me. I think I've heard pastors say, he loves him. He loves himself. We all, you're supposed to love yourself. You're not supposed to go around... Um, hating yourself i don't like my body i don't like this i don't like you know about myself you're supposed to love yourself we need to accept god's blessings as he gives them and accept them before they are received we live by faith but we are human and need to hear encouraging words instead of criticism all of the time our tongue is a weapon that is worse than a stick remember the stick and the stone um we have to live with our words on a daily basis. Sticks and stones might be used so harshly that a person could die. However, words never die. They live on even after an apology. You know, if you've done something wrong and that come, you know, somebody does something wrong, you do something wrong. You say, I accept your apology or I'm sorry, but our, our brain most of the time doesn't forget it. There is too, it's one of those things where you're afraid to let go because you're afraid it'll happen again. So you accept the apology, but you never forget it. And you're supposed to forget it. Um, those words can never be taken back. Forgiveness is a different subject. I'm going to catch them do that one later on probably. I challenge each one of you to find someone that needs encouraging and give them a lift in their spirit. Pat yourself on your backs and remind yourself, I am a child of God and he will always love me. You might find yourself being the only one speaking life over yourself, but you need it. You will be amazed how your words don't just lift them, but also you. Being optimistic is important in our lives. God doesn't want us to be whiners or complainers to him or to each other. Light, let's shine our lights bright with our words of hope, faith, love, and encouragement. Y'all have a good night. That's the end of my lesson. Love you.